the facts were being 5'10 and a half, a little under 5'11, running a 4'640 at my position, cornerback, I probably wouldn't have played in the NFL. But that's when I learned the difference between the facts and the truth. Too many people allow facts to become their truth. Welcome back to another episode of The Burn. I am Ben Newman, and what you may know is that Aeneas Williams is one of the 330 plus men to ever walk the face of the earth that is in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. One of the greatest to ever play the game. 55 interceptions in the regular season, 12 touchdowns, played in the Super Bowl with the St. Louis Rams when they were still here. Mm-hmm. Pro Bowls, 14 total years. That's what you do know. But what you may not know, and what my belief is, is Aeneas, what you have made a conscious choice to do off the football field mm-hmm. is far more extraordinary than anything that you ever did on it. Right. Now, another thing I know you do not know, your commitment to our friendship. Mm-hmm. There are two periods of time in my life as an adult Mm -hmm. where I was tremendously challenged in terms of what do I do? And I'm talking like tough, the real stuff of life where you have to go to people that you know have your back. And we we always say this when we're together. (laughs) We probably don't get to spend as much time together as we would like, but we always pick up right where we were. Absolutely. And there are two periods of time in my life. And I remember one was about six years ago. Mm -hmm and you gave me extraordinary advice. The other one happened five minutes ago. Wow. And you know, it's amazing how you continue to share with me, Mm -hmm. now as a pastor, now this beautiful church that's been built, which started with with your teammates (laughs) in Ladue, not too far from where we are, here in St. Louis, Uh and has now grown into being, to to, to spread the word to tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. And that's what you may not know, but, they certainly didn't know that you've been there to help me in those periods of time mm-hmm. because I think sometimes people hop on an Instagram account and they say, man, he's got, <laughs> this guy's got it going on. But I've needed people like you in mm-hmm. my life to help me see. And I know that's your commitment. Mm-hmm. Uh, the marriage that you and Tracy have, four beautiful children. Just I, I remember when the kids came over, It was uh, I think it was just Laz and Senea, mm-hmm. and they came over and they were playing Legos with the kids when they were just tiny. Right. And just like the way, the, how respectful they were, the, it was just incredible. And so there's, everybody would want to say, oh, I know that Hall of Famer Aeneas Williams. Mm-hmm. But what I'm really excited about today is for people to really get to know wow. Aeneas Williams. Thank you. And Glad so, to be with you, Ben. I appreciate your kind, those kind words as well. So share, share this with me. I talk about the burn, right? Mm -hmm. That fire that lies inside you. What what is that, when you hear that, what does that mean to you? The burn, right? That lights that why and that purpose Mm -hmm. on fire. I'll start out by by saying this. uh, Hopefully I don't cry doing this because the burn means a whole lot to me. You just talked about my wife, Tracer, 27 years. You just talked about the four beautiful children. You talked about the Hall of Fame. Uh, But so many times, just as social media, one of the disadvantages is many times people read into postings as a perfect life Mm -hmm. versus I wish we would post more of the process to the perceived perfect life because there's none. The burn that comes to me to answer that question, Ben, is the burn to not quit. Mm. Success is the ability to bear pain, not be a pain. I wish I could tell you it's been 27 years of bliss. It's been great, has not. I wish I can tell you raising the four, the three girls in the sun has been easy, has been great. There has been challenging times. And the biggest passion point burn right now that's coming to me to make sure anybody is listening Before I go into any of the 55 interceptions, all those things, to be great in life that God has called all of us to be great at something, there is a level of understanding that there is a burn to stay in it, 
to not quit, to understand that every part of it is a part of helping develop you to become the person you are supposed to be at each phase of your life. So when you, when you talk about burn, that's what I think about. When you, if you talk to anybody who's ever worked out with me, seen me work out, it's painful. My trainer, I, I identified and I chose Mac Newton intentionally because I knew I would never master a workout. It was never a time where I did every exercise and every rep in his class, never. Never was comfortable in his class. Never knew what was going to happen in his class the next day, even though it was pretty regimented. All of those things prepared me because in a game, I don't know what scenario I'm going to face. I don't know when they may have a completion, a touchdown on me, because they have, but I don't give up. One of my greatest assets with this passion, Ben, was the ability to get over a bad play. And as a pastor, Christ, going to the cross, dying for our sins, extending grace to us, mercy to us, all of this, he says, his mercies are new every day. All of this is because he knew as human beings, even after receiving Christ, we would jack it up. We'd push the envelope. But he gave us a way to give us a covenant, to give us a promise that even if you jack it up, if you'll be honest with me, as we had to be watching football, after Sunday we had to watch the game film, film Ben. I had to look at my mistakes. I had to own it. That's a big word for all of us. I own it. Because it's so easy as a defensive back. Hey, they caught the ball because the defensive line, they get to the quarterback. No, when you want to be great, your standard stays the same regardless of the perceived obstacles. So once again, when you talk about burn, I'm burning to tell people, hey, look at, look at the accolades, but make sure you understand there's a burn that each of us have to not quit. And whoever is listening, whoever will see this video, don't you dare quit. You may think about it, but once a thought crosses your mind, open your mouth and says, come hell or high water, I am not quitting. So I, I hear everything that you're saying. It's beautiful. It's bringing, it literally tears to my <laughs> eyes. I can see it in your face. Mm -hmm. And I picture you in your dorm room Southern University, you walked on mm -hmm. at the beginning of your junior year, most just having the courage to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Couldn't tell the parents until you figured out if you made right. the team. And then all of a sudden you play one year and you're sitting in your dorm room and I've seen the journal and it, it, it makes me emotional. And I can see the ink, the red ink in this journal because you've shared it with me. Mm -hmm. And you're getting ready to go into your senior year there's no big accolades at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And there, there's pages of goals, mm -hmm. right? And three that have always stood out to me. I will play in such a way that my coaches will get promoted to better jobs. Mm -hmm. I will lead my team to the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And I will be one of the greatest cornerbacks to ever play the game Hall of Fame. Yes, sir. And I remember you sharing that. I remember thinking to myself, you're at Southern University, you only, you only <laughs> played one year of college ball. So I've heard, I mean, mm -hmm. I remember when I was in Canton, when, when, when you had me, that was one of the coolest experiences of my life when you and Tracy invited me to be there. And Thanks I, for coming, by I, the way. Thank yeah. you so much. And I remember being with Malik, mm -hmm. who you played with in college, mm -hmm. who was in the front office with the Arizona Cardinals. He's like, man, you don't understand how that <laughs> man worked. Like, you don't understand. So it's, you, you're talking about this burn. You're saying don't mm. quit, but you had to choose to live it, but you also decided to think really big about what was possible. Mm -hmm. So how important is it to have this burn, but to also not protect yourself with your thoughts and to think big with the gifts that God's given you? Well, one, it, all of that on the hill, so going into my junior year, there are a couple of things that happened that precipitated that. The first one is, prior to me not walking on, it was one of the reasons I wasn't recruited coming out of high school. Second, my dad's first college graduate on both sides of the family, so sports was never our ticket out. The third reason is my brother Achilles, my idol, 18 months older, two grades ahead, was already at the Southern University, one double A, right? 
And Achilles is a numbers guy, academician. And Achilles was my model. When I got to Southern, I graduated from high school in May. The next month in June, I was in summer school at Southern in an apartment with a junior. So can you imagine the enjoyment and the, the fun that I had in golfing in essence my life in Achilles? Mm. Achilles majored in accounting, I did as well. The, he got involved in a fraternity, I did as well. He was involved in a student government association, I was as well. I don't even like uh, politics. Everything I did was Achilles. We both were going to school year round, summer school included, Ben. And he graduated with his accounting degree in three and a half years. I was on pace to graduate with my accounting degree in three years. Only one problem, I have an accounting degree to the day and I don't like numbers. My brother graduates, he's working for Price Waterhouse at the time. He calls me back, he says, little brother, slow down, you'll be working the rest of your life. At that time, I started trying to figure out who in the world is Aeneas. Prior to that, I was always known as Achilles' little brother. I'm following him, but I'm, I'm really not pleasant, happy at all. Didn't know this. So all of a sudden, around that time, my junior year that summer, I interviewed with, with the company, Fortune 500 company by the name of Cargill in Minnesota. I had an on-campus uh, interview, passed it, went well, had a plant visit. And normally a plant visit usually is just formalities and they offer you an internship during the summer. Two weeks later, when I got back to Southern after the plant visit, got a letter, sorry, Aeneas, you're a great candidate, but we will not hire you. Mm. A lot of my friends who were also in accounting, all of them got internships. So now I'm a little down. But I'll say this, God was up to something. I had no idea then, if I had gotten that internship, I would have never walked on the football team that summer. So all of a sudden, some things that uh, look like a no turn out to be a yes to something else. So now I start figuring out who in the world was Aeneas. And so I gave my, ended up giving my life to Jesus Christ that summer. I asked the Lord two things. Lord, tell me how you speak to us and tell me how we are to relate to you in everyday life. First thing he taught me was how he speaks. One to our hearts. I said, what do you mean? said, when Moses turned 40 years old, it entered into his heart to go visit his Hebrew brothers. He was living with Pharaoh up until that time. David, when David wanted to build God a temple, he told it to the prophet Nathan. And Nathan, that, Nathan told David, do all was in your heart until the prophet Nathan went to sleep that night. God gave him a vision, said, go back and tell David he's not to build my house. He's to gather the provisions and his son is going to build my house. So that's what I learned from David and Moses, God speaks to the heart. Why in the world would Aeneas walk on the team a week before the season starts? Guys have already been going through a month and a half of not just two a days, three a days. My parents, I'm the last child on their dime. They're paying for my education. So I'm getting ready to get out in three years, so why would you tell your parents something like that? So I didn't tell my parents, didn't tell my friends, it was in my heart to go ask the coach if I can walk on. I asked the coach if I can walk on. What happened? So people may say, well, how did you know that was God? Well, one, you don't know. You just go take the first step that you know to take. It wasn't anything that was going to hurt me. It wasn't if something that was going to cost my parents money that I would blindside them. It was just something that I wanted to take a step. My coach allowed me to walk on. The position I was going out for, Ben, the coach was trying to replace the player. I end up starting by the fifth game. My teammates hated me because I'm running around all happy and they upset because I didn't join them in a uh, month and a half of three days. So now I'm starting, but that's when I found out when you find your place, it doesn't matter how everyone feels about you. Mm. So all of a sudden I'm starting by the fifth game, Ben, and then I played two more years. The next year, I, they put me at cornerback. I led the conference with seven interceptions and made all conference. Then going into my final season, after my second season of playing football, Ben, I graduate, so I'm going to play my final third season while in graduate school. My coach at the end of the second season, who allowed me to walk on, in the uh, cover of the sports section of the newspaper, he was quoted as saying, Aeneas Williams is a good player, 
but I don't think he'll ever play in the pros because at best he runs a 4 6 40. I said, wow, that's pretty strong from the guy that actually gave you opportunity. And what I want to say to guys or ladies who's listening to this, a lot of people would have set their life now to prove the coach wrong. But that coach's assessment was the facts. The fact was, mm. I did run a 4'6". The facts were, being 5'10 and a half, a little under 5'11", running a 4'640", at my position, cornerback, I probably wouldn't have played in the NFL. But that's when I learned the difference between the facts and the truth. Too many people allow facts to become their truth. And my dad says all the time, it's not what people know that hurt them. It's what they do know that's not true. What I learned after reading that, I went to a teammate named Brian Thomas, who was one year under me. This is, when I wanna, this is where I want to point out to people, young people or anyone, your mentor does not have to be someone older. Brian was younger, one year younger. He played wide receiver. He was, he's 6'3", weighed about 205 pounds. He was the fastest guy on Southern's football team and the fastest guy on the track team. I went to him because he had speed. He was a receiver. I lined up 10 yards off of him as a defensive back. He would run by me. I couldn't cover him even though I was all conference. I went to Brian, Ben, and I said, Brian, can you help me get faster? And I went to him because he had credibility of speed. Now, this also against my natural inkling. All my life I've been taught in my formative years, either you have speed or you don't. You can't coach it, which is not true at all. You may not run as fast as I'm getting ready to tell you I was able to run, but you certainly can get faster. So I went to Brian and I said, Brian, can you help me get faster, Ben? He looked at me as I'm looking at you. He says, Aeneas, you can run a 4-3-40. And he said it so convincingly, and because of his credibility, I believed him. This is when I found out that belief can be transferred mm. into another human being. So I say, Brian, what do I do? Brian is also from New Orleans. This was at the end of the fall semester, December. We we're getting ready to have a break in between Christmas and New Year's. We were going to go home to New Orleans. Brian says, Aeneas, I'm going back when we go home and work out with my high school coach. I want you to get up 6 o'clock in the morning, come and meet us, and just get next to me and do everything that I do. I say, great, and I did it. I never trained like that before in my life. I hurt like I don't know what. When we got back to the spring semester while I'm in graduate school, Brian says, Aeneas, walk on the track team. I said, Brian, walk on the track. He said, yeah, you walked on the football team. I said, oh, yeah, you got a point, right? <laughs> I said, what do I do? Get next to me and do everything I do. I did it. I didn't know my teammates were coming out in the mornings and in the afternoon, afternoon watching us around the stadium and laughing at me. Because when I was running next to Brian, Brian, we take off, and if we were running the 400 meters, I'd be with Brian maybe the first 10 yards, and then he would leave me. And then I mosey on around, and then eventually at the end of the workout, I'm on the ground thinking I'm going to die. And Brian is walking like he hadn't trained. So I'm looking at him while my legs tell me while I'm on the ground, Ben, said, Nias, you can keep this up, but we're finished. This is January. April is the pro day when the pros come and work out all of the eligible players for the draft at Southern University. I clocked a 4-3-40. I became the second-rated cornerback in the nation behind Todd Light out of Notre Dame. That following fall, I set the national record with 11 interceptions and made uh, National Black College Player of the Year. All of that submitting to Brian, when you talk about the burn, when you mm. talk about the process, when you talk about Brian telling me also, Aeneas, while you're in the dorm, before you go to sleep, stretch. You need to get more flexibility. I used to couldn't touch below my knees. Then he says, Aeneas, speed has to do with footwork. Every night before you go to bed, jump rope. So literally, I was stretching and jumping rope while my teammates were going out to the clubs at night. I wasn't going. 
So all of these things, God can have a purpose for your life. There can be a destiny for your life. But the passion, that burn, has to be constructively put in a process of development with mentorship like a Brian Thomas and many others that had an impact on my life. Which leads me to a final question which ties right into this. Mm -hmm. Because you've talked about the burn on probably a deeper level than any, it's, I think it's hit you that question mm -hmm. more than anybody else we've interviewed, which mm -hmm. doesn't surprise me in any way, shape or right. form. It's been there this whole time. Mm -hmm. When you reached the mountaintop professionally, mm -hmm. having the opportunity to wear that yellow jacket, mm -hmm. you're on the stage in Canton. And many times we hear speeches that might be about accolades, statistics, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. I think back to watching you 15 rows from that stage, sitting there with the greatest show on turf, all of them around me. Right. And I remember you said, start with the end in mind and die empty. Mm -hmm. And to me, I, when I think of that speech and how that impacted me, and I love going back and watching it on YouTube, I'll send it to guys. You had an opportunity to talk all about you. But instead, you took that opportunity, just like you do every time we're together, mm -hmm. Because you always want to ask me more about me than I got about what's going on with you. And you made it all about every single person watching. Mm -hmm. Almost like you were speaking to every person sitting in Canton and everybody whose eyes were on the NFL network that night mm -hmm. and everybody whose eyes would see a replay of it on YouTube or wherever it was. So why did you choose those words? Start with the end in mind and die empty in this period of time. Mm -hmm. When the lights are on you and you could have talked about whatever you wanted to talk about. Tonight in the same room, 7 p.m., we will have a locker room. Men will come from all over the city, Ben. Tonight's title is, Why Are Men Great Until They Have to Be Great? Say it again. Why are men great until they have to be great? I learned this from Christ and his spirit. He said he didn't come to be served, but to serve. Why I ask you every time I see you, why I focus on everyone that was listening, because I didn't come for them to hear about all that what I've done. I've come to take what I've done and share with them that there is a Lord named Jesus Christ and there's a God who's placed greatness in every one of us in some area. Every one of us, no matter where you come from, has the ability and has talent on the inside of them. And where we came from and the situations we were birthed in does not determine that. That's the first thing. The second thing is the intentionality of living. That when there are things in your heart, remember I said God speaks to us through the heart. That's not just to Aeneas, that's any human being. I mean, there are things that are in people's hearts that they ignore because they don't know how to get there. But when I write it down, I take it serious. So when I write down, I want to make sure I play in such a way that my coaches will get promoted. So a defensive back coach can go to a defensive coordinator that I played under. That a defensive coordinator that I played under becomes a head coach. Why? Because what you make happen for other people, God makes happen for you. Begin with the end in mind. You go, if I would survey and ask any citizen, any human being, where can you find the most wealth? Most of them would tell me places like Fort Knox, banks, things like that. I would tell them the cemetery. Why? Most people go to the grave with their potential never tapped. Diseases possibly cured through a person who end up like Aeneas could have freshman, sophomore year. If you had told me you have the ability to be one of the best cornerbacks to ever play in the game, I would have thought you were crazy, <laughs> right? So here I have this ability in me and it's dormant and I could have gone to the grave never ever accomplishing that. So begin with the end in mind is to look out intentionally where you want to go. One of the unique things that seem to continually cause Jesus to have enormous confidence besides being God in the flesh is he said, I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. That is a huge stabilizing statement. Where did I come from? Did I come from trash? Absolutely not. Every one of us. Could I have been born into a trashy situation? Yes, but I am not trash. 
Do I know where I'm going? I want to be a complete corner. So I wrote it down. So then I identified while in college a cornerback or two who had those characteristics in the pros. I didn't find one, I found two. Ronnie Lott, who at that time was playing cornerback in the pros, one of the hardest hitting cornerbacks ever to play in the game, later played safety. The other guy was Frank Minifield, a guy my height who was also a shutdown corner with the Cleveland Browns. So I had a shirt spray painted uh, Ben with the name Mini Lot on the back. And I would walk around my campus, teammates laughing at me, <laughs> what on the back of my shirt, Mini Lot. So they would jokingly call me Mini Lot, but what they didn't really, really, re what they didn't realize, I had already decided what I wanted to be and how I played the game. So most times when I now see fans, usually if, they are co if they're football enthusiasts, they're going to say to me, you were a complete corner. And I always tell them, thank you. So begin with the end in mind, is intentionally start, sit down. We study on social media, which is great. We study so many different people's lives, we admire them. That's great. But I start posting, start paying attention to yourself. The stardom that's in you, what makes you unique. Start writing down the things that's in your heart that you may not even know or think that you can accomplish. We didn't actually cost you nothing to write it down, right? And then die empty. I never got to the epitome, like you mentioned, that was the mountain, right? People refer to it as that. No, that was just the next step. That was the next, now I'm on the next chapter. And the same requirement is to fulfill my potential and to help others do the same in this venue and in other venues that I have an opportunity to be exposed to. And when it says, begin with the end in mind and die empty. It's a great way to remind ourselves, be intentional, and know at the end of the day, live without regrets. Final thing I'll say, there's so many guys I know that leave the game of football with regrets. Because at some point, they got distracted while playing it. Something else, the ladies, the money, family issues, all got them to getting away from the game that they love and putting their passion and their hard work into it. Now they're at the highest level. That's what I love to tell the current guys. This is your time. People always say, do you wish you could play now with the money? Absolutely not. Not because I don't love the game. It's because I did what I was supposed to at the time I was supposed to. So now I enjoy doing the work I do with owners, with the commissioner, with Troy Vinson, <coughs> vice president of football operations that I serve, and with, uh, with the legends, with your former players. I love doing it because it's a great game and it has a lot to do with life. So when you talk about the burn, Ben, this is what I hope that comes through this camera, that comes through our voice, that will be heard. And I say to you, and listening to you, and I know people know you from following you, but I am honored to serve as your brother in this interview and to watch you, and to watch you lead your family, to watch you lead even your dad in that relationship. This, this man, and I'm telling whoever's listening, is, has been tried and tested. So what you're getting from this content is not just fluff. I'm telling you, not this is a perfect man, neither am I. But I am telling you, this is a man that lives his principles and the content that he's giving you will impact your life.